humanity and the world. Today, let us talk about the relationship that can develop between an individual human soul and anthroposophical spiritual science as we understand it here. Generally, people don't sufficiently realize that our soul's relationship to this spiritual science must be very different from that of any other science or any other body of knowledge relating to the human soul. Indeed, the spiritual science that we're talking about here does not speak to the same part of our soul that any other science or body of knowledge addresses. Other sciences and disciplines teach us this or that. We learn something about the one or the other thing and end up knowing more than we did before. In contrast, spiritual science does not relate to our soul by just offering information that we can add to our store of knowledge and then repeat. Rather, it appears, excuse me, it appeals to much deeper impulses in our soul, deeper than mere knowing or mere thinking. That is, spiritual science addresses, or at least wants to address, our inmost being, our deepest core. Coming from the spiritual world, our inmost being enters our physical human life when we are born and at our death it returns to the spiritual world to work on other tasks. To understand the full significance of spiritual science for the human soul, we must accept in our thinking and feeling what its true relationship to the external world and to our life is. You see, to fully understand ourselves as human beings, we must realize that when we take on our physical body at birth, something lives and develops within us, something that accompanies us throughout life, from the inexperienced state of childhood through our adult years of gaining experience and becoming more skillful, through our destiny as it unfolds within us. In other words, everything that happens in our body and our life is really due to the transformation of a spirit-soul being that has lived in the spiritual soul realm long before our birth or conception. And the spiritual science we're talking about here is addressed to this soul-spiritual being living within our body. You may wonder why we should concern ourselves with our spirit-soul being at all, since it can surely make its way in the world by itself. On the contrary, it cannot do so. Our spirit-soul being seizes us, so to speak. It permeates us and, in a sense, clothes itself partially in our physical body, our abilities and our destiny. In fact, in the developmental phase we have now reached, and which sets the direction of our future development, it is more than ever before in our interest to set free what lives as a spiritual principle in our body, in our life story and talents, and in our destiny. Ultimately, we cannot escape the spirit, It lives in us whether we pay attention to it or not. Even the most idle and easygoing people who have never made any effort to develop any religious or spiritual inclinations of their own but have remained lethargic and impassive, even they are not without spirit. To call anyone spiritless is always wrong. Nobody is without spirit and nobody can live in this world without spirit. Our spirit and soul are our innate gift given to us as we come from the spiritual world to enter this physical one. And each person's portion of this gift is based on what he or she went through 
before descending to their current life on earth. Thus we are never without spirit, but we can choose to ignore the spirit within us. We can even go so far as to practically offend the spiritual within us by refusing to set it free. We may want to allow it to live in us, to cloak itself within us, but may refuse to liberate it, to set it free in us. Once we can look at human life like this, our outlook on life will change, which is much needed indeed. As a result, when we come across impassive and insensitive people, we will not condemn them as being spiritless, but will understand that they have committed the sin of burying the spirit within them during their life here. They have left their spirit under the spell that has bound it to the physical body and have allowed it to enter only their outer life and to degenerate in their destiny. We only become human beings at birth because our spirit-soul individuality comes down out of spiritual soul worlds and enters our being. In early childhood, we are as yet imperfect and unclear expressions of that spiritual individuality, which is nevertheless already present within us. We are free to ignore this spiritual individuality or to free it from the spell that bound it to our body. We can gradually release it from our body, our life story, and our destiny. Indeed, releasing it is our mission and will become an increasingly urgent task in the future. It is up to us to keep the spirit from deteriorating. While we cannot kill the spirit within us, we can let it deteriorate if we force it into a path different from the one it takes when we set it free. Once we've made up our minds to learn something about the spiritual worlds, we draw such knowledge from within ourselves. Everything else serves only as a suggestion. The knowledge itself, everything you've ever learned about the spiritual worlds and spiritual science, has come from inside you. It has lived deep inside you and had to get out. It simply had to come out. Indeed, it is destined to be brought out and we offend against the world order if we condemn the spirit to remaining within our physical body. For there it will go astray and will be doomed to a destiny it was not supposed to have. To set the spirit free, we must release it from its captivity in our physical body. As we consciously permeating ourselves with the spirit, we set free what wants to be released out of the depths of our being. It is essential that we understand this. I'm going to read that again. I think there's a slight error. As we consciously permeate ourselves with the Spirit, we set free what wants to be released out of the depths of our being. It is essential that we understand this. Indeed, we must realize that the problem with materialism is not that it simply suppresses any dissenting views or promotes the wrong view. Rather, the problem is that materialism diverts what wants to enter our soul as knowledge and sensitivity and guides it downward into coarse matter instead and lets it run riot there. Ultimately, we will have to decide in the near future whether we want to allow the spirit to proliferate unchecked in the realm of matter or whether we want to transform the spirit into thoughts, feelings, and will impulses. If we choose the former and the spirit runs riot in matter, it will become deformed and fall into a diabolical, aramonic madness. But if we choose the second option and transform the spirit within us, it will live in our midst and will complete what it set out to achieve when it entered earthly life through us. 
for what the Spirit wants above all is that we participate fully in the life of the earth, and that is why we should not hold it back but release it. The more we resist learning about the Spirit, the more we hold it back and force it down into the realm of matter, which as a result becomes worse than it is. The Spirit, too, has its assigned mission, to enter into life on earth by way of our soul development and thus to bring blessings. If it is thrown back into the realm of matter, it will work there to disastrous and devastating effect. All these insights are results of spiritual science and you can easily see their great relevance to our life. Spiritual science is not intended as just another theory, one among many. Instead its aim is to help us set the spirit free, to release it from its captivity in our human nature so that it can accomplish what the spiritual worlds want to achieve here. That is also the reason why many people still resolutely reject spiritual science even though they are only too willing to accept other sciences. After all, other sciences flatter people's pride and vanity and do not claim to be anything real. They only promise to give people new ideas, train their intellect and perhaps even give them a few useful moral concepts. No other science claims to address the core of our being and to originate from worlds where the spirit has been given a mission to fulfill. Only spiritual science does. Basically, spiritual science is very serious about what we need to know, and that's something people shy away from. They'd rather keep spiritual science, like everything else, comfortably burbling along on the surface of their life. People are afraid of anything directed at the core of their being, and that is one reason why they reject spiritual science. If people were to accept spiritual science, there would be many changes where society and history are concerned, and people would have to change their thinking even in ordinary everyday life, and those changes are what are essential. Studying other sciences does not change us. We remain the same, only richer in knowledge. In contrast, we cannot study spiritual science without being changed by it, and that is how it is supposed to be. Spiritual science gradually and slowly transforms us as we study it. We must be patient with the process, but it happens unfailingly, because spiritual science addresses itself to other tasks of humanity, to different elements of our human nature than the other sciences do. Studying human nature reveals that human life is very diverse and unfolds essentially in three streams or soul impulses, imagining, feeling, and willing. These three pretty much cover everything that makes up our life, and all three have a particular relationship to the element in our soul, in the core of our being, that spiritual science calls upon. To begin with, let's look closely at imagining. You see, the ordinary sciences and their impact on children's education, and thus on our long-term destiny and practical everyday life, because it is so thir because it is to thoroughly shape our children's development, all this does not nurture our imagination. This prevalent development began not that long ago, maybe a few centuries ago and by now people hardly notice it anymore. It will not be long, however, before people will become more and more aware of the things I'm talking about here. You can study scientific concepts, especially as they are now taught to our children, all your life without having to make any changes in your thinking or imagining. In fact, you not only remain unchanged, but your intellect also becomes undeniably ever more limited 
thanks to those scientific concepts that increasingly are a staple of public education. As a result, our thinking spirit becomes too stiff to make its way into living conditions that are much more complicated than we can know based on our ordinary knowledge alone. You see, it is heartrending to look deeper into life to see how people immersed in current scientific concepts are becoming less and less able to understand living social connections and the demands our society makes on us, that they are gradually pushed away from true life. For example, as I've said here the other day and also elsewhere, if parliaments and legislatures were made up only of people who are steeped in the modern worldview, who have become educated on a natural scientific basis, we'd see that the decisions made by these learned people with their scientific thinking will reduce our social institutions to rack and ruin. Concepts and thinking based on the natural sciences can never bear fruit for our social existence. We find the same in many other areas, too. In every case, we lose a certain mobility and flexibility of spirit due to merely intellectual knowledge. Once we apply the concepts of spiritual science, though, everything changes. Among other things, you'll notice the state of your spirit as you try to understand what spiritual science offers and that it differs from the one you need when learning what the outer world offers these days under the name, quote-unquote, education. Doubtlessly, spiritual science meets with resistance, because understanding it requires us to be flexible and fluid in spirit. In contrast, people find it easy and effortless to navigate the current offerings of popular and cultured literature. They feel even more at home with its offshoot, namely journalism and are happy to get their education from the Sunday papers. And in lectures these days, people usually get the material in bite-sized portions and are shown pictures and slides so they don't have to think for themselves at all and don't have to get their spirit moving. Clearly, none of this liberates our thinking, imagining spirit. Instead, we become increasingly narrow-minded and limited and our spirit loses its unself-conscious nature. In other words, the intellectual education now prevalent leads to spiritual narrow-mindedness. While there has been great progress in intellectual education, especially in regard to the natural sciences, it is nevertheless a path to narrow-mindedness and limits our thinking and imagination. In contrast, To understand spiritual science, we must call upon something very different in our imagination, in our mind. It is thus not surprising that people are afraid of taking even the first step toward spiritual science, and after reading just a few pages, many complain that they are getting lost in the text and cannot follow it, that it is too fantastical for them. But there is nothing fantastical about spiritual science. It's rather a matter of people having lost the ability to really free their thoughts, to immerse themselves in reality with them, and being too dependent on the outer sensory world dictating and guiding their thoughts. One of the things spiritual science does for us is to call on that force within us that throws off the shackles of narrow-mindedness and frees our thinking, our mind, to understand not just a little, but very much indeed. As I said in a public lecture in Stuttgart recently, in spiritual science we do not care whether a person is a materialist or a spiritualist. That's irrelevant. And I mean this seriously. It really does not matter. What does matter is to develop sufficient spiritual strength to advance in the right way. If you have that strength, you'll find the spirit even if you are a materialist. You'll find it in matter and its processes if you're consistent in your search. 
And even if you are a spiritualist, you won't spend all your time chanting, Spirit, Spirit, Spirit. You will also be immersed in material, practical life and will work to reap the fruit of your thinking in your actions. In other words, versatility is what modern life demands, and the future will demand it even more. And versatility is the first gift spiritual science offers. Indeed, this is precisely what we need as we prepare for the future. When you look at life today and the catastrophic events all around us, you'll see that one of the deeper causes of our current catastrophe is that so many people have become one-sided. Despite advanced scientific education, they're not able to see and understand things from various angles. Their spirit, their mind, is not flexible enough to immerse itself in reality. In contrast, flexibility is precisely what we gain through our involvement with spiritual science. Spiritual science also bears fruit for our feelings. For when we think of the way spiritual science calls on us to think and get used to a much more fluid world, we are setting something free that usually lives concealed within us and allow it to unfold. In fact, the rhythm of the cosmos lives in our feeling, which we bring with us from the period before birth. It does so to a much greater extent than people usually believe. There's even numerical proof for this, but very few people know anything about these mysteries of life. Don't be scared or shy, and join me in taking a closer look at how the rhythm of the cosmos lives in our organism and all its processes. For example, we all know that the sun rises at a slightly different spot from year to year. It moves a tiny bit every year. In ancient times, the vernal equinox was in the sign of Taurus, and later in Aries. It has continued to move every year, and occurs now in the sign of Pisces. In other words, the sun does not rise at the same spot in the heavens on March 21st of every year. That is why we see it circling the earth. It is only after about 25,920 years that the sun returns to the same spot having come full circle, or seemingly so, in completing its elliptical orbit. That is, that is, in about 25,920 years from now, the sun will again rise at the exact same point in Pisces where we saw it rise today. This vast interval of 25,920 years was called a great cosmic year by the Greeks. Now, the curious thing is that to get the number of days of this cosmic year, we must divide 25,920 by 365. The result is 70 or 71. That is, one day of the great cosmic year is 70 or 71 earthly years long. Interestingly enough, that is the average human lifespan. In other words, taking our average lifespan as one day and multiplying it by 365 gives us the platonic or cosmic year. This is the time it takes for the sun to complete its orbit once and return to its exact position, 365 cosmic days, one of which is the average duration of our earthly life. It's a beautiful rhythm. Still, there's more to it. For example, we take about 18 breaths per minute. Multiplying these 18 breaths by 60, we get the number of breaths we take in one hour. And multiplying these by 24 tells us how often we breathe in one day and one night. Now 18 multiplied by 60 and then multiplying the result by 24 comes to 25,000. 920. In other words, the average number of breaths we take in a day is the same as the number of earthly years the sun takes to complete its orbit once, that is one cosmic year. Our breath 
and the progression of the sun across the heavens share one and the same rhythm. On average, we breathe 25,920 times a day, and in a sense, each day is like one breath, because in the morning our physical body and ether body breathe in our eye, capital, and astral body, and at night when we fall asleep we breathe them out again. Thus every day is really one inhalation and one exhalation. Now let's calculate how often this happens in one solar day or the average human lifespan, that is in 70 or 71 years. When we multiply our figures, you can do the math yourself, we get 25,920. That is, our daily breathing in and out occurs pretty much exactly 25,920 times over the average lifespan. That is also the number of days we live through in our 71 years. Thus each breath is to the total number of breaths in a 24-hour period as the advancing of the vernal equinox in one year is to the movement of the sun over a period of 25,920 years. Our earthly life is to the great cosmic year what one day is to our whole life. And there are as many 24-hour periods in our lifespan of 21 ye 71 years as there are earthly years in the revolution of the sun back to the same spot. Let yourself feel what this means, the grandeur of being part of the beautiful rhythm of the glorious sunlit cosmos of our inner life expressing, even in a purely mathematical way, the grand cosmic music of the spheres. When we really allow ourselves to feel this, we will know ourselves as a microcosm in relation to the vast macrocosm, and will realize that the great infinite world of the gods has created its image in us. This is something we can really feel and experience the feeling of being part of the cosmos, of participating in the spirituality of the world, is what spiritual science gives us. In contrast to our usual narrow, closed-minded focus on our I, capital, with this feeling we really open ourselves to the world. We are an image of the gods, but don't ordinarily realize this. We only begin to feel ourselves an image of the divine world, a microcosm in the macrocosm, when we come to know ourselves through our feelings. Of course, this is a slow and gradual process. I'd like to sum it up in these words. Just as we go through life by slowly living one day after another, so immersing ourselves with our feelings in spiritual science, will gradually create the above-described feeling in us. And it is vitally important that we develop this feeling, for it will inspire us to undertake the great tasks the future will bring. Even though this still sounds strange, it is nevertheless true that within the next fifty years so much will be demanded of us that unless we have developed this world feeling within us, we will no longer be able to build factories or grow crops. Our current catastrophe is just one of the symptoms of the impasse we have reached. Though the world has advanced, we have not kept pace with our thoughts and feelings. That is why they don't enable us to really deeply understand this world and to live and work in it harmoniously. On the contrary, disharmony will grow among us and there will be more and more strife and warfare unless we can learn to enter into the cosmic harmony with our feelings and carry these feelings into everything we do, even into the smallest and most mundane things. Clearly, spiritual science is closely connected with what must directly intervene in our outer cultural practices if we're ever to get out of our impasse. In the future, 
We will not be able to build factories or schools unless we can develop new concepts based on our grand cosmic tasks. These tasks have already been there for a while, but people have ignored them, and that is the cause of our current catastrophe. Indeed, the deeper causes for the catastrophe of our time can be found in what I have explained today. The divine signs that are expressed in these catastrophic events must be heeded. All of us must learn to develop a conscious relationship to the cosmos because nothing else will work. Let me give you an example. Many may still call it foolish or denounce it as mad, but it applies nonetheless. What I mean is that while great progress has been made, for instance in chemistry, it was achieved without the world feeling I've just described. In the future, we will have to add this feeling. In other words, the lab bench will have to become an altar. The service to nature we're involved in, even in chemistry experiments, must be permeated by the realization of the great cosmic laws that govern the lab bench at all times. For example, when we dissolve one substance in another to obtain a certain precipitate. We will approach our work quite differently and make quite different discoveries once we feel ourselves part of the whole universe. While the discoveries made up to now are doubtlessly great, they can't bear fruit for us in the right way because they were made without reverence, without the feeling of being steeped in the cosmic harmony. Over the centuries many people have speculated abstractly about, about what Pythagoras meant by the music of the spheres. Those speculations are clearly devoid of any feeling for the rhythm that permeates the cosmos, for the music of the spheres is experienced in that rhythm. That is what Pythagoras meant. He was not talking about something abstract, but about a vivid, real feeling. What would happen if we didn't open our soul to our feelings in this way? As we've just said, for one thing, our thinking and imagining must become more fluid, versatile, and open-minded. Likewise, our feelings must become generous, receptive, and open to the world. In other words, the opposite of Philistinism. And this Philistinism is the very thing our modern culture, which is a great blessing according to many materialistically thinking people, has raised from its resting place at the bottom of our soul. Nothing can vanquish this Philistinism except open-mindedness and generous receptiveness of the soul. The feeling that we are microcosm within the macrocosm and reverence for the divine spiritual that wafts and pulses through the world. Thus, where our mind and imagination are concerned, spiritual science must overcome intellectual narrow-mindedness, and regarding our feelings, it must vanquish Philistinism. A third development concerns our will which we're still in the beginning stages of exploring and understanding. So far, only psychologists and those who know the human soul intimately can see what is being prepared and will eventually appear. Despite what many people believe these days, those who can see deep down into the course of our development know that there, know that where our will is concerned Nothing is so prevalent, now even more so than ever before, as clumsiness. It threatens to turn into a terrible evil in the future, a development whose beginnings we can already see. For example, people nowadays are instructed to do this or that one-sidedly. However, if you tried to do something, but have not learned the right moves through hands-on instruction, you will not be able to figure it out. To mention a very ordinary example, if I may, many people these days could not sew buttons on their pants if they had to, 
because they were not taught. Only very few people can do anything that's not directly related to what they have learned or been trained to do. Clearly, that is a deplorable development and must not be allowed to gain ground. For if we were to become as one-sided as our so-called blessed modern culture wants us to be, we would waste our spiritual legacy that we brought with us out of the spiritual world when we descended into this life at birth. To really understand how all these things are connected, we must get beyond merely considering them theoretically and become vividly engaged in spiritual science. Then one-sidedness will be anathema to us, since spiritual science will evoke a feeling in our soul that helps us to be more fluid and versatile. The more we study spiritual science, not just intellectually, but by fully immersing ourselves in it so that it flows through our soul the way blood flows through our body, the more fluid and versatile we become in responding and adapting to the world around us. In fact, we will be able to do things we've been too clumsy to do before because we become more skilled in our willing and thus also more adaptable. You may want to object here what many people say about our anthroposophical society, namely that its members don't seem to be particularly skillful or able to cope with life. Now, I'm not saying this, but merely repeating what others have said. What they're talking about is really an indication that we have not yet reached the point where the anthroposophical life has permeated our souls like blood permeates our body. Rather, the bad habit to approach everything only with the intellect or the power of reason has been carried in from the outside. For many people, spiritual science, too, will just be another theory, something to think, but not something they live, not part of their being. If you only think spiritual science, then it doesn't matter whether you read a book about spiritual science or a cookbook, though perhaps the cookbook may be of more use to you. We have to take spiritual science so seriously that it really takes hold of our soul, of our whole inner essential being. Only then can it move into our limbs and loosen them up, and as a result we will become more skilled at living, better able to cope with life. To this end we must develop an inner conviction and not be satisfied with the outer one. Once you engage in spiritual science in a lively, zestful way and realize its value for your inner life, you will find that it can prolong physical life. People may object that this or that anthroposophist died at only 45 or only 27 years of age, but we simply have to ask, in return, how long would the anthroposophist who died at 45 have lived? if he or she had not become involved with spiritual science in his or her twenties. And regarding such matters of the inner life, the external methods of proof don't apply. Statistics and the like are of no use to us here. They're very useful for outer life, but do not even begin to touch on the principle of life. For example, it makes sense to base insurance policies on statistics and arithmetic to insure individuals on the basis of calculations regarding how long they're likely to live. Still, it wouldn't occur to us that we have to die when the insurance company's actuarial calculations say we will die. In other words, we don't let calculations determine our reality. They're important and even decisive for outer life but have no relevance for our inner life. Statistics, probability calculations, and the like are valuable for outer life, but are useless when it comes to evidence for the spiritual. You'll have such evidence when you accept spiritual science as an elixir, as an elixir of life that will enable you to fit into the larger context of life 
and that will lead to many new developments. Some time ago I was saddened at what I saw when I was eating dinner at someone's house, and perhaps, as some claim, being saddened by this makes me a strange fellow. At any rate, all during dinner my host weighed out his portions of meat and vegetables on a scale. He had to weigh out every item so as to know how much to eat. You can imagine that if we all wanted to weigh out our exact portion of rice or cabbage at every meal, chaos and uncertainty regarding our instincts would result, and we would owe this uncertainty to purely intellectual science, which can only address outer facts with its statistics and other methods. However, the point here is not that we'd be losing our instinct, and intellectual education will indeed stunt it, but that we must spiritualize it, so that we develop an instinctual certainty, so to speak, in our spiritual life. This is what I wanted to point out today in regard to our will. Spiritual science makes its way into our willing and changes it so that we become more skilled for the world around us without even noticing how we gradually grow into what surrounds us. The closer we grow to the Spirit, the more and the better we grow into the world around us. To this end we must become able to experience the Spirit, which spiritual science enables us to do. Experiencing the Spirit will become increasingly important for us in the future. After all, how do we experience what we bring with us at conception or birth? To understand this, let's use an analogy. For example, when a cannon is fired at some distance from you, you'll hear the explosion, and just before that you'll see the flash of fire. If you yourself were shot off with the cannonball and flew through the air alongside it at the same speed of sound, you wouldn't hear the sound at all. In other words, when you move at the speed of sound, you can't hear the sound at all. Similarly, we don't notice the spirit working in us, because we're moving from birth to death at the same speed at which the spirit works. But the moment you begin to take in the truths of spiritual science, you move at a different pace than your body, and then you begin to see the world in a new light. In other words, just as we perceive sound only if we don't move at the speed of sound, so we notice the Spirit's work in our life only if we change to a different pace by cultivating inner peace, as I have outlined in my book titled How to Know Higher Worlds. We must not live at the speed of our body, but must develop a different pace, and developing this is of the utmost importance for humanity. Nowadays people don't think or know much about what life was like in the past. History may indeed be mostly a fabrication, but that's not what I want to talk about today. My point here is that in earlier times people were raised differently, with more attention given to their feelings and disposition. The predominantly intellectual life and education we have now has only developed in the last four or five centuries and does not take into account that we are multifaceted beings. Our intellect is indeed very malleable and capable of being developed, but only up to a certain point in life. After that it cannot be developed further. This is especially true in our current epoch, where our head, which is the seat of the intellect, is capable of further development at most until age 28. While our intellect can be developed especially while, while we're still young, this ends when we're about 28 years old. That is, our head is capable of being developed for only about a third of our time here on earth. In contrast, the rest of our organism remains capable of further development throughout our whole life and continues to place demands on us throughout life. These days, schools give us only what I call head knowledge, that is purely intellectual knowledge that speaks only to our reason and no heart knowledge or knowledge that addresses our whole organism. 
Head and heart really have to be in constant interaction regarding our ethics and our soul. But nowadays this interaction is impossible because in our schools we give our children only knowledge for the head and not enough for the heart and the rest of the organism. By age 35 that is a problem because then we have at most only what we remember of the head knowledge from our school days and can recall that intellectually. However, we're currently not taught in school in such a way that we later are able not just to recall what we learned but can actually lovingly enter with our feelings into the learning we absorbed in our youth and have it still present within us so that we can revive it. That is the ideal spiritual science pursues where education is concerned, more than mere recollection. Of course, these days, people don't even recollect what they've learned and usually forget everything once they've passed their final exams. And if we do remember, we don't usually recall our school years very fondly. In contrast with spiritual science, you can feel when you recall those years that the dawn of your life is shining into your soul and that as a result of getting older you can now transform that recollection into something new. You'll realize then that what you learned was taught in such a way that you not only remember it but can also transform it and make it new. Once we renew education and our whole culture with the principles of spiritual science, we will be able to breathe new life into what lives in our soul, and as a result we will see fewer symptoms of premature aging. If we study humanity's development properly, we'll see that prior to the 15th century, even the oldest people in the population were not as old as many people nowadays already are in their youth. Symptoms of advanced aging are spreading everywhere and can only be controlled if we steep ourselves in the feeling that what we learn in our youth can then be transformed as we get older and can become new for us. In other words, what we learn is not just to be recalled later, but also to be transmuted because we remember our school years fondly as heaven on earth. As an elixir of life, spiritual science will bring about this change in our daily practical life and in our schools and turn them into places where all of human life, our whole life span, is considered. For what we give our children in their school years re-emerges in a different way in their old age. For example, when we teach children in such a way that they develop admiration and reverence for something, those feelings will reappear in their mature years after remaining dormant in the intervening period. When these feelings emerge from their dormancy in our later years, they enable us to have a positive effect on children. As I put it in a previous public lecture, if we have not learned as children to fold our hands in prayer, we cannot spread them in blessing when we are old. The feeling associated with folding our hands in prayer re-emerges in our old age, transformed into the capacity to bless others. We don't even realize what we're giving our children from age 7 to 14, as well as earlier and after age 14 with our modern education for their later life. This is a very serious issue because in those early years the foundation is laid for the megalomania, arrogance and prejudice we find among our young people and especially for the notion that they could already have a quote-unquote standpoint. Nowadays even the youngest ones proclaim about this or that, that is not my standpoint. These days everyone must have a standpoint, but it is, of course, impossible to have one at the early age of twenty, something people are unfortunately no longer taught. In summary, what lives within us will once again be brought to bear upon reality, and reality will be brought into a wholesome relationship to our soul, 
That is the ideal spiritual science is striving toward, regarding the relation of our soul to reality. Regarding the larger context of life, people often say things without any connection to reality. And if we know how our soul should relate to reality, then it's agonizing to hear them and to see the form modern thinking now takes. Children suffer such agonies unconsciously when their teachers think like that. For example, recently I attended the inaugural lecture of a renowned professor of literature, which he began by saying we could ask this or that question and listed some he planned to answer in the course of the semester. Then he exclaimed, quote, Gentlemen, I have led you into a forest of question marks. Close quote. I had to imagine a forest consisting of countless question marks. But people whose powers of imagining and picturing are impoverished would be facing this forest without having a picture of it in their soul. We must not underestimate the gravity of such a situation, but must continue to strive for a living relationship to reality. Recently a statesman said that our relationship to the neighboring monarchy is the crucial point that must guide the direction of our future political decisions. In other words, the relationship between two countries is a point and then becomes a direction. Well, it's hardly possible to think of anything more unreal. You can probably guess that this person's soul life must be very far removed from reality to produce such cant and phrase-mongering. Of course, such a soul is just as removed from our outer social life and does not immerse itself in it. Whatever it happens to dream up will never become real. Spiritual science makes it impossible to indulge in the unreal thinking that leads to the phrase-mongering that is gaining ground nowadays. But people are so deluded and arrogant these days that they believe themselves to be especially practical, even though they have only become schoolmasterly and have really lost touch with life. Indeed, future generations will find it strange that in our time people are so impressed with the quote-unquote world's schoolmaster, Woodrow Wilson, whose thinking has not even the slightest hint of a connection to reality and who is never saying anything real or true. Still, people admire him anyway, even those who have a few scruples because their country is at war with him. Surprisingly enough, even many of the Central European powers think highly of Woodrow Wilson. Future generations will find it particularly puzzling that political programs without any relation to reality are now being developed in which the noble ideals of international understanding and world peace treaties are set forth. If only it were that easy. After all, abstract thinkers think since the time of the Stoics had been dreaming of this. The ideas now hailed as Wilsonian, have actually been around since the dawn of humankind, as those familiar with these ideas know very well. Of course, if we think in a healthy way, we'll have to admit that if such ideals have always been around but have never been realized, they're clearly not healthy for us. We only delight in such unreal ideas if our thinking has become estranged from reality. All these things are connected with the most profound principles and impulses of life. And there is so much chaos and confusion all around us nowadays because so many people have adopted a way of thinking that they believe to be a match for practical life, but that is actually far removed from true reality. The ideal that spiritual science wants to bring us is the combination of reality with a resolute thinking that is strong enough to enter into reality. To attain this, we have to start with our children at an early age and develop in them a sense, not for abstract concepts, but for what is real, what can be imagined. Of course, this means that we ourselves must first develop such a connection to reality. For example, if we want to teach children about immortality by showing them a butterfly emerging from its chrysalis, 
but do not believe in immortality ourselves, we are not actually teaching the children anything. When we are engaged in spiritual science, we know that the butterfly is the true image of immortality created by the spirit of the world. We believe in this image ourselves, and for our teaching we choose only what we believe in ourselves, only what we know or strive to know. In this way we immerse ourselves in reality and work on vanquishing our egotism that wants to hold on to abstractions in our thinking. As we immerse ourselves in the spirit of reality, we will find the paths humanity needs in modern times, especially since they have been abandoned by those priding themselves on being practical. However, those are not truly practical people, but rather impoverished people who brutally impose their impoverishment on the rest of us. The only way out of this difficult situation is to find the spirit and thus reality. In conclusion, what I wanted to emphasize in this talk is that we must develop a feeling for the relationship between our soul and the world, a feeling that emerges from the basic mood of our soul in spiritual science. Indeed, this basic mood is even more important than the various facts of spiritual science because it accompanies us throughout our whole life once spiritual science has kindled it within us.